in John 13, it says, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me later. And then in John 14, it says, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On the day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. And then in Matthew, surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. This is kind of difficult because of the passing of several uh, friends in the, in the community, but I'll go ahead. It says, all of us have experience to adjusting to the absence of someone we love. We have been absent of a childhood friend who moved away, of a death, of a parent, or a brother or sister who's gone off to college or uh, went their separate ways in life. But when you walk through their room, you see objects that remind you of them and their presence uh, is real even in their absence. Uh, sometimes uh, your senses, like your smell, you smell someone, uh, cologne or a perfume that someone that you love that's gone on has, uh, it reminds you, it comes back, uh, that uh, that's what my fa father wore or my mother wore or great aunt or whatever. Uh, but it says when you perform some simple task, you remember doing it well with them or being taught how to do it. <coughs> when you sit down for the family meal, you notice who is missing as much as who's not missing. And it's the same way in our, it, it affects me, the same way in our church. I visualize people that I've known that have gone on. They had a favorite seat. That seat's empty. Sometimes, uh, it says you notice they're missing as much as not missing. You notice that those who tended to take for granted and their pre presence is real, even in their absence. In fact, at times, it might be truer to say their presence is all the more real in their absence. It's the same way at this table and it's a paradox where I go, you cannot follow me now. Alongside, lo, I will be with you always. It's a paradox of his presence made real even in his absence. Perhaps, especially in his absence. So when we partake today, we notice his absence from the table. We think of Jesus apart uh, from us, but more a part of us than if he was here with us. As we break the bread, uh, we think this is and not was his body. And as we drink the cup, we remember this is and not was the cup of the new covenant in his blood. So hopefully today as you partake and you gather around this table, it'll help us to remember Jesus Christ. Help us to handle 
his absence by celebrating his presence through Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you thanking you for your love, thanking you for your son that came and died on that cruel cross in our stead. And thank you for this opportunity that we have as Christians to gather around your table and remember uh, what Christ has done for each of us. And through his love and through your love, may each of us participate in a worthy manner. And what we say and do here today, Lord, let it be a blessing to each of us. And hopefully you'll accept it. Uh, as a form of our worship and love. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
special? You're special? Okay. I'm not singing, so. <laughs> so, if you uh, all notice, Michael's not here today, so, and then Joe was supposed to do this, and he's got a sick kid, so it's kind of been improvised, but we want to welcome Dwayne, and he's going to give us our message today. Well, you know, I was reading your bulletin there, saw the order of service, <clears throat> and then uh, we saw how we started out, and nothing went like it was planned, and I said, I'm in the right place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well... I'm glad some of you got to church on time, you know, with extra hour. <laughs> That's good. Have your Bibles. We're going to go to Revelation here in a little while. But nevertheless, we'll, we'll get there. <clears throat> it's always good to be, be with you folks. And, and uh, last night I was talking to my daughter down in Texas. And I told her I was preaching today. And she said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Canton. And she said, Canton. She said, Dad, isn't that the place where the ladies gave us those vegetables? I said, yes, it was. <laughs> you know, so she remembered Miss Harp gave us some vegetables last time when she was here. So uh, it's strange how people remember their stomach real well, you know. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. It was on a Sunday morning. About 4 o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning, it was December 7, 1941. The USS Ward was a destroyer on patrol in near Pearl Harbor. It received a message from the, uh, a minesweeper called a Condor that had spotted a submarine nearby. The Ward went looking for it but never did find anything. Well, about 6.30 that morning, the ward received another message, this time from a PBY. Now, that's an airplane flying patrol. It had spotted a submarine following a ship in the Pearl Harbor. The ward went looking for it, and this time it found it. The ward attacked and fired the first shots in World War II. It sunk a Japanese submarine. Lieutenant William Albridge, skipper of the ward, notified Pearl Harbor. But guess what? Nobody took him seriously. About 7.30 that morning, Admiral Kimmel was notified, and he dismissed it as nonsense. And guess what? Nobody ever notified the Army. Folks, those are facts. They're in the history book. About the same time on a radar station on island Oahu, the radar, radar crew notified the first lieutenant, uh, Kermit Tyler, that they had spotted a blip on a radar machine, on a radar screen, indicating a large number of aircraft about 130 miles away approaching very fast. Lieutenant Tyler knew that there was a schedule to be a flight of B-17 bombers come in from the mainland that morning. And he said, just forget it. Lieutenant Tyler would forget that or would regret that decision the rest of his life. You see, that blip turned out to be the first wave of the Japanese aircraft to attack Pearl Harbor. A short time later, 180 planes, 
first wave of 420 planes to tap the ship in Pearl Harbor. 2,403 Americans were killed. Another 1,178 wounded. 430 on the battleship Oklahoma. 1,100 on the Arizona. And it wasn't until 2002 that the Japanese submarine was found in about 1,300 feet of water that the crew of the ward was uh, vindicated. Now, I have to ask myself the question, and maybe you know the answer, but what would the outcome been if the warnings, which had been totally ignored, had been taken seriously? What would the outcome been? Let's go back a few years. It's on the Lord's Day, Sunday morning, sometime. Another warning was given, but this time it was given to a prison inmate. A prison inmate. This convict was old, an old preacher of the gospel. His crime was that he refused to deny his Lord Jesus and bow to a Roman emperor. Now he was in prison on a small rocky island, Patmos, in the Aegean Sea. Now we're in the book of Revelation. If you have trouble finding it, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Revelation. You'll get it. This is what he says. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, Write on a scroll what you see. And send it to the seven churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Now, there's much I don't understand about this tremendous book. But every time I read it, I receive a blessing. Many folk consider it too hard to understand. <coughs> but I want you to notice verse 3. It says, Blessed first word blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it because the end is near this book just may be the most neglected book in the bible for many years folk have considered it too hard to understand but in the last few years with all the turmoil in the world People beginning to ask, is this the end? The revelation John received and passed on to us has not been preached or taught because it seemed too difficult for a lot of people. But God promised a great blessing to the folk who would read it and pay attention to the warning signs. Preachers call it an apocalyptic book. From the Greek, which means to remove the veil, to uncover, to reveal, or to make clear. The warning which John sent to the first century churches was very clear and should be very clear to us today. The end is near. The return of Christ is near. His faithful judgment is near. The beginning of eternity is near. The question for each one of us today is, where will we spend eternity? How are we going to get there? Now let's take a break. Notice some features that might help us understand the book a little bit better. The number seven is a very distinctive feature. It's used 52 times at least. And there are seven churches, seven spirits, Seven golden lampstands, seven stars, seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes, seven trumpets, seven thunders, seven signs, seven crowns, seven plagues, seven golden bowls, seven hills, and seven kings. Revelation is an apocalyptic a writing that's very symbolic. Fortunately, for us, the book gives a good number of clues to, to these symbols. 
the stars are angels. The lampstands are churches. The great prostitute is Babylon. And the heavenly Jerusalem is the wife of the Lamb. And symbolically, number seven stands for completeness. Even though John's vision refers to unseen time and future events, they are nevertheless real. The end is coming. Judgment is not far away. The question is, are you going to be gathered in with the wheat? Are you going to be burned up with the chaff? Are you going to go to the left with the goats into a godless eternity in hell, the burning fires of hell? Or are you going to go to the right with the saved? You know, that's your choice. It's your choice. God doesn't send anybody to hell. They go by their own choice. Let's take a quick look at this old man, John. What inspired him to write this letter about 2,000 years ago that still boggles the mind of believers and unbelievers alike? Most of the group of men he traveled with and learned from Jesus for over three years were dead. They had been martyred for their faith in the risen Christ. This wrinkled old man sitting in a prison cave writing on a letter on a piece of parchment does not resemble the young Galilean fisherman who dropped his fish full of, uh, his net full of fish to become a fisherman of man. This old man bears little resemblance to the young man who once stood with Jesus on the Mount Transfiguration. He doesn't look anything like he did when he asked for a prominent seat next to Jesus when he set up his kingdom. We read there in Mark 15, or 10th chapter. Here's an old man. Must have been late 80s, 90s, I don't know. And now he's a convict in a lonely, rocking, rocky prison labor camp. The world would say he's finished, over the hill, done with, too old for anything. Remember something. You never get too old for God to use. God wasn't finished with this old guy. Notice again that 10th verse. On the Lord's day, I was in the Spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, Write on the scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches. Apparently, John was praying and meditating on Sunday morning, and it was time like this that God spoke to him, and he will do the same to us. And when we read, pray, and meditate. <clears throat> now, folks, we need to learn a lesson in John. We need to turn off that TV. Find a quiet place and concentrate on God's Word. Just you and your Bible. The devil won't like it. I can tell you what's going to happen when you do that. Your nose is going to itch. You're going to have to go to the bathroom. Your leg is going to hurt. The phone's going to ring. All kinds of things. But stay with it. Meditate on God's Word. You know, a simple reading of 10 chapters a day will put you through the Bible three times with lots of time left over. Try it. Try it. And God will speak to you. You'll find things in there that you never knew was in there. I tell people all the time, every time I read it, God has put something in there that wasn't in there the last time. He, he does those tricky things. John concentrated on one theme. The end of history as we know it and the coming of a new age. His message is a message of warning and hope. Warning of the coming judgment and hope of Christ's triumph over evil. The end of the devil and his angels and the establishment of God's eternal kingdom. The church has a mission today. Get the word out. 
Sin will not go unpunished, and God will judge the righteous and the unrighteous. There's a blessed hope for the Christian and a promised judgment for those who re reject Jesus as Lord and Savior. My wife Barbara and I attended a Billy Graham crusade in Kansas City several years ago. George Beverly Shea sang before Graham, Graham spoke. <clears throat> he sang the song, How Big Is God? A song that was written by Stuart Hamlin. The message of that song still rings true today. It is big enough to rule the universe, yet small enough to live in my heart. Think about it. Almighty God, the ruler of his creation, there's no reason to be afraid of the future because he holds in his hands the whole world. At the same time, his spirit is able to fill the void of every aching heart. As I read this revelation, my prayer is that God will convict lost men and women of the fact of a coming judgment and that they will come to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Today, perhaps better, more than ever, we need to listen to John's message. We need to hear his call for repentance and its challenge to live godly lives, to take a, to take a stand for purity, for justice, and righteous living, no matter what others may say or do. John took a stand and put him in jail because he did. Now, question. Are you willing to stake a stand for Jesus? If you're faced with jail time, would you still stand up for what's righteous? John was concerned about people's lost souls because he knew God loved them and sent his son Jesus to die for them. John was a pastor, a prophet, and an evangelist. He knew that the worst thing he could do would be assure, uh, assure people that everything was all right. There was no reason to be concerned about the evil world or God's judgment. Today we hear a lot of preachers on TV preach that God is loving God, and they never mention hell or judgment. As far as I can tell, Jesus had more to say about hell than anybody else. Proverbs 11.30 reminds us, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. And then Daniel put it this way, Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Time is running out. We must get the word out. We must be honest with people and warn them of the coming judgment. You've probably heard about the bishop and the reverend. You know, they had a church out by the highway. They had a good crowd. And they were well known for their preaching the goodwill and everything is going to be okay sermon. One day they put up a sign out by the road in front of the church that said, simply said, stop, turn around, the end is near. They were out there admiring their sign one day. A car full of good old boys came down the road. And they saw them standing out there. And the old boy, good old boys, get out of the way, you religious kooks. And they stepped on the gas and over the hill they went. And suddenly you hear the screech in the tires on the pavement. And then there was a big splash. And then it was quiet. The bishop turned to the reverend. He said, maybe we should have just said the bridge is out. <laughs> we need to warn our loved ones and our neighbors their bridge may be out. God speaking us to the psalmist said, He who goes out weeping, carrying seeds to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. When you have the word of God in your life, when it's alive, when it radiates in your character with the Holy Spirit, there will be a burning in your heart and a desire to see souls saved. As I said, John was an evangelist. 
The word evangelist comes from the Greek words meaning to, to announce the good news. In this case, the good news is so say the gospel of Jesus. John knew the worst thing he could do was let people believe that everything was all right. And there was no reason for him to be concerned about all, all the evil in the world or God's judgment. You know, folks, the devil is sharp. He fooled many churches and church members to follow the ways of the world. If the devil can talk angels out of heaven, he can certainly talk church members into a burning hell. Biblical standards have been compromised and replaced with social theories. In many churches, the Bible is treated like a collection of out-of-date fairy tales. Notice Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. You must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the fertility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separating from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality as to indulge in every kind of impurity and lust. Every Christian in every nation must decide their loyalties to Christ. In America, we see clear evidence of growing intolerance toward Christian values. It's not always acceptable to profess Christ as once worked in America. But the Bible commands us to take up our cross daily. Compromising and conforming to the standard of the world is a sin and is against the teaching of God's word. The people in the seven churches whom Revelation written are no different folks today. Just as they did, we ask, what does all this mean? Notice what confronted them. Warnings of hoofbeats and horsemen. Vision of seals and scrolls. Dragons, angels, false prophets and the faithful. Slaying in the streets, singing around the throne. The lake of fire and a river of life, plagues and harvest, rebellion and repentance, the beast and the judge, the liar is exiled and the lamb is exalted, and finally Satan is defeated. Folks, we need to get the word out. Jesus is coming. I don't know the exact date for that to tell you. Invite somebody to church to come with you. Many of you came to church today by yourself. You've got plenty of space in your car to bring two or three with you. Do that. When you wake up at night, pray for a dear friend that they may come to know Jesus. Lift a little after 8 o'clock, May 7, 1945. An American paratrooper huddled in a foxhole in a little town in Czechoslovakia heard a radio transmission. It simply said, cease all forward movement. It had been 443 days since he parachuted into the war with Germany, and now it was over. Someday that trumpet will sound, and time as we know it will cease, and the great judgment will begin. What about you? Are you ready? What about your loved ones? Is there a bridge out? I'm going to sing our invitation this morning. You're here and you need to make a decision of any kind. We invite you to do so. Shall we stand and get ready to sing?